Good afternoon and welcome back to the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. We've had quite a show so far this morning. We've been talking a lot about the submersible uh, and how doomed uh, it may well be because it's going to run out of air pretty soon. And at the moment, nobody really has a clue about where to even look for it, never mind where to find it. We'll keep you updated, of course, as much as we possibly can uh, as, this, as the show uh, goes on. Later on in this hour, uh, we're going to be talking about a great many things with Alex Salmon. We've got Prime Minister's questions coming up as well. Peter Cardwell uh, will be bringing us the best of that as it gets underway right now. You've got Keir Starmer uh, versus Rishi Sunak uh, in the chamber, uh, having a bit of a go at each other, all about the economy, all about the interest rate problems, all about homeowners and what they're supposed to do if they cannot any longer forward to make that monthly payment but of course as I've been saying for a very long time uh, what the government should very very much not be doing uh, is in any way sort of uh, subsidizing people's mortgage payments because as much as it may be a very difficult pill to swallow unfortunately if you buy into a housing situation and the mortgages go up to the point where you can't afford to pay them anymore then you have to sell the house it's that simple Annabel Denham is here as well deputy comment editor at the Telegraph let's kick things off uh, with her she's also got a thing or two to say no doubt about the wokists in our schools as well Annabel a very good afternoon to you Good afternoon, Mike. So, um, it's not a very happy place to be if you've got a mortgage, particularly if you've got a, um, a variable rate mortgage or a fixed rate mortgage which is coming up for renewal. Uh, the belief is there's an awful lot of people just in this little window of a month or two weeks uh, are going to be absolutely hammered. I've been speaking to people who think their mortgages are going to go up by sort of somewhere between three and six hundred pounds a month. Yes, there are a lot of people who are going to feel, I'm afraid, an immense amount of pain as interest rates continue to rise, uh, mortgage payments continue to rise, and it really looks as though inflation is embedded now. It simply is not coming down for a long time. We didn't seem to think it was going to be a problem. Then we thought it was going to be transitory, but no, here we have extremely sticky inflation. And when you look at core inflation, it's not even sticky, Mike. It's actually going up. It mm. increased in May from 6.8 to 7.1%. You're absolutely right that there are going to be people up and down the country who are really going to suffer. And many of those people are already suffering because let's not forget we're in the midst of a cost of living crisis. Um, now, the government introduced the energy price guarantee to try and cushion some of the impact of uh, soaring energy bills. And it's now under pressure to do the same, to introduce some kind of mortgage bailout. But this would be economically illiterate. It would be an enormous act of economic self-harm for a start it would be ruinously expensive look at the millions of homes up and down the country which have mortgages on them if we are really looking at some kind of you know, increase to perhaps six percent there's simply no way that the government can can fund that so it really ought to be off the table and certainly should uh, you know never um return it it feels as though there's this this, this time bomb uh that has been the fuse of which has been lit and at some point it's going to explode particularly i imagine under um um, the middle classes. The other problem with this, of course, as we had with the energy price guarantee, and economists warned of this at the time, is that it doesn't deter consumption. So when we introduced the energy price guarantee, there was no incentive for people to uh, reduce the amount of energy mm. that they use. And if we introduce some kind of mortgage bailout, then it's not going to disincentivize people from taking out mortgages that are simply going to be beyond what they can afford should interest rates continue to rise uh, you know, higher. And I I think that there's also a, a moral case to be made against some kind of mortgage bailout. What we saw during the coronavirus pandemic was the government stepping in to wrap its arms around us and protect and shield us from any real uh, hardship. So we had the furlough, which cost about £70 billion. We had the government issuing a huge number of, of loans. And I think that that normalised the idea that when you run into some kind of difficulty, the government is going to bail you out. And, you know, I, we simply need to wean people off this idea. And introducing some kind of mortgage bailout it is not going to do that. Now, what I think is going to be very interesting is what happens in the coming days and weeks with the Labour Party, because the Liberal Democrats have already called for this, but that's all very well when you're not going to be the party that goes into power. What is Labour going to do? Is it going to start to tighten the screws on the Conservatives? Is it going to suggest that were it in power, it would introduce some kind of mortgage bailout? Because if it does does that, then it, you know, this idea that the Tories have insisted is off the table could find its way back mm. on it, and that 
that's very troubling indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think the thing about giving money for people to help to pay their um, electricity bills and their gas bills and their oil bills and all of that was a kind of a universal thing. Some people were critical that it shouldn't have been given to everyone and some people didn't actually need it and all of that. But mortgages are a very different kettle of fish, aren't they? Because not everybody has a mortgage, not everybody owns a house. And you'd effectively be asking people who are taxpayers who don't own a house to pay the mortgages of people who do. That's absolutely right. You're expecting renters ultimately to subsidise homeowners who may be more wealthy than they are, which is frankly immoral. It's extremely problematic. Yeah. Let's not forget rents are going up enormously because what the government is doing in addition of course to failing to build homes to address supply uh, and therefore uh, bring down the cost of actually buying a house and perhaps stop people from really really stretching themselves the government is also hammering landlords so we've seen this exodus of landlords uh, from the market that means there are fewer properties available and that means that the costs are going up it's layering more and more uh, regulations on landlords i think they've got to adhere uh, to about 150 now but now you know we've got all of these new energy regs that they're going to have to comply with and there are a lot of people who are perhaps looking at getting a buy to let property who aren't going to bother there are a lot of landlords who are thinking it simply isn't worth the effort and they are going to put their properties on the market and there is no guarantee that the person who buys them is going to be renting them out themselves so right. the this, you know renters are being absolutely hammered uh, at the moment and it, you know it, it doesn't seem fair at all like you say mike to prioritize homeowners over those individuals no exactly right and of course there's not really much that they can do i mean one of the things that rishi sunak said he wanted to do one of his five uh, point plans uh, was to reduce inflation but clearly, as people said to him, he said it wasn't our fault the inflation went up. Well, then it won't be your fault if it comes down either, presumably. No, his five promises at the start of the year were more like forecasts. He could well have suggested that he was going to ensure the sun shone uh, in June. And of course, the irony now is that he's really struggling to deliver on them. So uh, the NHS backlog just seems to be getting longer and longer, around seven and a half million people now waiting for treatment. We had, in addition to the inflation, inflation data out today. We've had the GDP data and we know that uh, the debt to GDP ratio has gone uh, over 100. Uh, so it doesn't look like Rishi's going to be bringing down the national debt as he promised. Of course, we've got the inflation rate, which uh, is either remaining sticky or if you look at that core, in, uh, core inflation, is actually going up. He's promised that the economy will be growing. Well, the trouble is that if the Bank of England perhaps over correct but raises interest rates too much then it might tip the uk into recession so mm. he's going to struggle to deliver on that and of course the number of boats that are crossing the channel now a few weeks ago you had rishi and dover saying that the numbers have come down but really making himself a hostage to fortune it was quite clear that that was a consequence of the fact that we'd had a uh, pretty miserable weather during the spring and well, yeah during the spring bring uh, pretty rough seas and as soon as it became more cle clement we saw a massive increase right. in the number of boats crossing the channel uh, but no to your point uh, on inflation i think we now know that it is a monetary problem so it's that core price inflation it's it's the d domestic factors that you know is really causing a, a massive uh, issue and that is the consequence of this massive increase that we saw in the broad supply of money during the coronavirus pandemic and there were some warnings for from economists at the time that the government needed needed to tighten monetary policy, but instead it remained very loose for far too long. It wasn't until December 2021 that they started to raise uh, interest rates. And we've had a number of uh, raises in the intervening period. We've, they're going, the Monetary Policy Committee is going to be meeting tomorrow. They're there's an ex expectation that there will be uh, a 0.25 uh, percentage point increase, if not more, possibly a half percentage point uh, increase. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's going to be enough to bring it down. But this is a real headache uh, for the Prime Minister. People are going to be feeling it in, in, you know, in their pockets. It's eroding their pay packets. People are not going to be feeling uh, as though they are getting wealthier. Um, and it's hard to think that there's anything Thing, but more pain to come. Yeah, and it's also a sense that it's out of his hands. You know, Rishi Sunak does not appear to be in control of the economy. And no matter whether that's true or not, that's the perception. And that's never good for any prime minister, is it? No, that's right. Now, I'm not wholly comfortable with this idea that the government should be trying to control the economy uh, to begin with, but certainly that's the impression mm. that the very uh, technocratic managerial 
imperialist Rishi Sunak has been trying to give. And yet here we have a, a public sector that is just getting bigger and bigger, public sector borrowing in May alone was £20 billion. Pounds. We've never had more people working uh, in the NHS, and yet uh, productivity uh, in the NHS has gone backwards. Indeed, in the public sector productivity has gone backwards. I think it's about 5.7% lower than it was before the pandemic compared with about 1.3% uh, in the private sector. So the public sector, it seems to me, is completely out of control. There doesn't seem to be any appetite for reining it in. And on the current trajectory, you know, that jet debt GDP GDP ratio is going to increase enormously. Inflation, as you say, is now run away. It, it, it just seems to be ticking up or remaining very, very sticky. And little that the government seems to be able to do about that. Economic growth, no real appetite for supply side uh, reform, which of course in and of itself would actually help with uh, inflation. If we made it easier for businesses to build, say, factories, if we made it easier for businesses to bring new products to market, then perhaps that could ease some of the inflationary pressures. As I say, now National debt is going up, uh, no appetite for supply side reform. You know, everything is moving in the wrong direction. And here we have the grown ups in charge coming in uh, and promising, you know, more August style of man management after the Liz Trust debacle. And things are simply getting worse. And the thing that strikes me and has struck me this week with particular interest going towards the Tata Steel Company and, and Jaguar Land Rover is that they only seem to be interested in helping multinational companies, this government. You know, they're not interested in helping, you know, the, the, sort of the small shop owner, the small business owner, you know, the heart and soul of, of the economy of this country. Ordinary people with small businesses and, and medium-sized businesses that employ quite a few people and pay quite a lot of tax. They're getting no breaks at all. But if you Tata Steel, uh, you might get 300 million quid uh, to help make your factory a bit more green. Yes, that's right. I think the government has been too tempted to subsidise um, bigger businesses, perhaps in order to attract them to uh, you know, create jobs or set up uh, factories and offices here. And you're right that successive governments have, have talked a very good talk on entrepreneurship, on supporting small businesses. But at the same time, we've had this regulatory ratchet. So look at something like labour market regulation, Mike, and how you know it's regulating for a minimum wage, holiday pay, sick pay. Uh, a high level of uh, regulation really coming into the gig economy. It's very difficult for people to be self-employed, to be contractors. Uh, we had the introduction of IR35 that made it more difficult to be a consultant or a contractor. You know, all of these things that the government does is sort of knee-jerk short-term policy making, perhaps to adva uh, advantage a, a small uh, vested interest group, a pressure group, but often at the expense of many more people uh, than it actually benefits. And it is introduced things like the Edinburgh reforms and that's very positive but at the same time you know look at all of the controversy around the retained EU law bill and the fact that the government has significantly scaled back its ambitions there we have you know increasingly regulated economy that is limiting the room for maneuver of ordinary men women and businesses and this cost has to be borne somewhere initially it will be felt by mm. the business but eventually they will pass it on to workers in the form of lower wages or onto their customers in the form of higher prices. And it, it surprises me that the unintended consequences of all of this never really seems to be thought through. And, you know, a final point on that, of course, is our high streets. You talked about, uh, you know, local shops and the fact that they are being you know, impacted by some of the decisions that the government is making. And, it, you know, there's no real appetite, I don't think, to address uh, the fact that we've got very high business rates, the fact that local councils seem to be stepping in and making it more and more difficult for people, say, to come in and park in local towns in order that they can support local businesses. And so, you know, all of these problems, some of which may be politically difficult to correct, but there doesn't seem to be any will to do so regardless. No, there really doesn't. Stay with us, Annabelle, if you would. I want to talk about lockdown. Uh, this morning, The Telegraph, uh, your paper's got a big piece uh, quoting the chief medical officer, former chief medical officer, Sally Davis, saying that lockdown damaged an entire generation. And uh, we'll come back to that with Annabelle Denham from The Telegraph. Coming next.
Welcome back to the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Chris in Norwich says this. He says, I think I'll have to stop listening to your programme, Mike, informing us of what's really going on in this country. I don't think my blood pressure can take it. Uh, well, stick with it, Chris, because hopefully we'll come up with one or two solutions to what it is that is going wrong. We're talking to Annabelle Denham right now, Deputy Comment Editor of The Telegraph. And this morning, uh, your front page lead, Annabelle, uh, all about uh, evidence given by Dame Sally Davis, who was Chief Medical Officer for England between um, 19... Sorry, from... Uh, 2011 to 2019 before Sir Chris Whitty took over, giving some pretty harrowing evidence yesterday about uh, eating disorders amongst young women, about how lockdown damaged an entire generation, um, quoting from this Lancet study as well. I mean, I think we can't overestimate how damaging that whole lockdown period was. No, I think that's right. And I suspect that we're going to be hearing more and more about this as time goes on. The the long term effects of uh, lockdown throughout uh, the coronavirus pandemic, we had uh, the identifiable victim problem, Mike. So it was very obvious who was being affected by mm. uh, COVID, uh, those who caught it, those who were most likely to die from it, those who were most likely to be hospitalized. Uh, and so we locked down in order to protect those individuals. And we did not give of due consideration to the economic, social, and indeed health costs of trapping people in their homes. Now, um, the former chief medical officer has obviously uh, talked about uh, the impact that it had, particularly on young people. The first, uh, one of the first uh, former government officials to criticise lockdown. And I think this is really welcome. I think it's a great shame that we didn't hear arguments like this being made actually during the pandemic. And I think it's interesting that despite uh, raising these concerns, despite making these criticisms, she still thinks that we ought to have locked down uh, a week earlier. Um, and I still well, think... It doesn't that make any sense, does it? Well, I, I imagine that the, 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 the suggestion is that had we locked down earlier, then we could have had a shorter, sharper uh, lockdown and reopened more quickly. Of course, you know, let's not forget that we initially locked down for th a three-week period to squash the sombrero, and yet there we were a couple of months later, still trapped in our homes, schools were still shut, kids were being, you know, isolated from their friends, and this had massive impacts on young people. They were deprived of education, they were shut in their rooms are you spending hours and hours on zoom uh you know maybe social media is their only outlet to the rest of the world you know i'm generally in favor of social media but i don't think it's the only way that young people should be able to communicate with their friends often you had very stressed parents who were trying to homeschool their children at the same time as working full-time jobs um and ultimately it seems to me that there was a total breakdown ultimately in the social contract during the lockdown so we no longer had adults trying to protect their children but rather children having to make massive sacrifices in order to protect broadly speaking adults who were in the later stages of their lives and this was always going to have a, a massive impact you know this this is such a breakdown to, in my view of of society you know that we allowed the, this to happen that we allowed children to be stuck and isolated and growing increasingly anxious and this is this has had a enormous consequences, enormous impacts uh, you know, on them, on their mental well-being, on their physical health. They were ultimately part of some great social mm. experiment that went horribly wrong. Yes, and I think an awful lot of children uh, who are now a little bit older, and even some of the parents of those children, have just kind of given up in a way. You see it uh, in a lot of the schools um, around the country. I mean, the schools are another story we'll come on to in a second. But, but you know, the, the, because nothing seemed to matter during those times, when you could turn around as a child and say, well, I don't need to go to school because the school's shut and they don't really care if I do any homework, they don't really care if I do an exam. If I do an exam, it doesn't really get marked properly, they're just going to give me a grade that's made up. You know, the whole purpose of sort of being at school was done away with, and so you can't really blame them for now saying, well, what does it matter? None of it matters. No, I think that's right. And people have grown increasingly despondent that uh, education has been devalued. We know that attendance levels are still below what they were before the pandemic. Uh, this is obviously troubling for everybody, but particularly perhaps those from underprivileged backgrounds who really need to get back into the classroom in order to keep up. And I know that we're, you know, we're going to talk about schools, but it seems to me as though a lot of schools now themselves 
themselves have given up that they're just trying to meet the sort of lowest common denominator and not trying to go above and beyond to help pupils to catch up you know there was a lot of talk about additional funding going to schools in order that we could enable kids to catch up on what was ultimately a year maybe a year and a half yeah. of lost learning and it seems as though that commitment has really just sort of subsided that there's there's not enough interest in helping to make up for all of that lost lost learning among young people yeah the, the, the exam stuff was an absolute fiasco i think a levels gcse's you know all of that was also devalued and it's absolutely you know there's a desperate need for us to try and get this back on track but the government is fire, fighting fires on so many fronts that you know education is just being forgotten well, that's right. And it's no wonder, is it, that somewhere along that line, things got a little bit confused and a little bit lost when we hear from that school in Rye this week that, you know, a teacher's arguing with children about whether or not somebody should be able to identify as a cat because otherwise it's a despicable thing not to accept it. And then we hear, from, again, your paper this week, dinosaurs, you know, somebody uh, identifying as the moon, somebody identifying as, as, as all manner of different types of animals. I mean, it's just bizarre, isn't it? It is. We've got to the ad absurdum part of this argument. You know, it started off with identifying as different genders. And at the time, some people joked that if you could identify as a different gender, why not identify as a different species? Well, you know, here we are. I question how many people genuinely believe themselves to be cats rather than perhaps wanting to act like uh, a cat. But it's nonetheless absolutely extraordinary uh, that teachers are taking such a hard line on this. Thank goodness we actually have that recording so we can get some uh, indication of what might be happening uh, in the classroom. Um, I think the problem we have, Mike, is that, you know, it's all about affirmation now. It's mm. about lived experience. It's about my truth. And that inevitably leads to children being completely indulged in their fantasies. And at the same time, we're allowing uh, biology to be denied. We're allowing language to be completely uh, eroded. It, you know, it's, it's in some instances, language is sim simply losing all meaning of we get to a situation where politicians can't de define a woman are we soon going to get to a position where politicians are struggling to define the word human uh, as well you know that there needs to be some massive correction uh, on all of this and i think it begins with adults uh, remembering rediscovering who is in charge here uh, and ensuring that they are you know protecting children and guiding children rather than purely indulging them yeah it really is extraordinary how many schools are reporting that this is going on and you have to imagine that uh, it is some kind of trend because we hear all the time from various different uh, people that ring the show that, you know, there's now more and more children effectively saying that they want to have a different gender or they want to be recognised as having um, a transition going on in their lives. And, I mean, it seems as though the government is going to step in. Also, Gillian Keegan is going to do some kind of investigation into the school in Rye. But I think they sort of need to get a grip of the curriculum here, don't they? I think that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, sexual education in schools in recent months has been found to be completely uh, lacking. I think, like I say, you know, teachers are not taking the right uh, view on this, perhaps because they're frightened to, because let's not forget that that, that extreme wing of the trans lobby is very vocal um, and very uh, you know, quick to um, bring together some kind of Twitter mob. Um, and that can lead to careers being destroyed. You know, fr frankly, there are a lot of people out there who are simply afraid to voice their views. And those same people uh, have no ill feeling towards uh, transgender people, not, not not at all, but they are allowed at the same time to hold the view that there is such a thing as a biological woman. Right. And, you know, my, my feeling actually, Mike, now is that this has been pushed so far, look at what happened with Oxfam, for instance, that there will be some kind of retrenchment that, you know, we've identified what the high watermark is and what the public are willing to accept. Um, and I think that that hopefully will empower the government, it will give the government some confidence to roll something out through the national curriculum that injects some much needed sense back into this debate. Like I say, I think that for too long, you know, there 
group, certain groups of society have been uh, overindulged. They've been, you know, absolutely sort of vocal, powerfully vocal, um, at some, in some cases extreme uh, in their views. And I think that, you know, there is some kind of fight back underway and that's absolutely to be welcomed. And if schools are not properly uh, educating children around all of this, then my view is that they're actually failing in their duty of care. Um, so, as I say, it's absolutely to be welcomed. Mm, I think absolutely right. Well, I'll see you down at Wicks over the weekend then, buying some paint, no doubt. Uh, we shall see whether that happens. Annabelle, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Annabelle Denham, Deputy Comment Editor there uh, from The Telegraph. Coming up shortly, Peter Cardwell will be here uh, with all the highlights from Prime Minister's questions, uh, still just about finishing over in uh, Parliament. But, of course, uh, we'll also have Alex Salmond as well, and we'll have the world awoke.